Hey. Oh. Oh, is a bit of an echo here. Is it from me or is it from you? <laughs> Actually, it sounds good now. I think the the algorithms did their thing. Okay, cool. Thank God. Quite possibly for the theme of the future. Yeah, really. <laughs> about it. <laughs> so this recording in the future. Welcome to live stream of consciousness episode four. It's not a live stream this time, but it will be one day. This is the poor man's solution to set the example for everyone with the worst internet to still do this if they want to be part of the podcast future, which doesn't necessarily involve Facebook. Uh, this is we're using Zoom and YouTube and well, Facebook will be involved in a way, but what's up? Like so many things, but also nothing, which yeah. is like, I feel like is the theme of COVID. <laughs> um, you want to explain to me what just happened in the security world? Um, or do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, I guess, yeah, I'll do a little quick introduction. So um, I'm Alana. You can call me Staz, though. That's probably easier. Um, and I am a cybersecurity consultant. Um, so that's what a lot of people know me for. I'm also a musician and artist. So that's kind of the thing people knew me for before I was a consultant. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I do a lot of, uh, I mean, I work in cybersecurity, obviously. Um, did a lot of research on cyber warfare at one point. So that's sort of like my my like real cybersecurity passion, but um, yeah, just doing all the things, honestly, just watching how the world's, you know, playing out right now. <laughs> so what's your, what's your read on the global situation? I, so like, like truth be told, I've been pretty lazy about it. Um, yeah. There is the solar winds hack. So like, I didn't even really right. look that far into it. It's pretty bad apparently. So <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to assume like, like I'm pretty sure solar winds is like, like uh, some sort of like infrastructure asset company or something. I, I probably shouldn't shouldn't say yeah. what I think it is because honestly that's like bad press. Um, but <laughs> it, it's bad apparently. Um, but then more recently I was seeing a bunch of articles like just today about how uh, Russia is all up in the U.S. like right now, like in literally everything it's like they're in, in like you know the government infrastructure they're in like the municipal like infrastructure of these cities they're in like you know private companies like it's like fucking whack um and they've been chilling there for like you know they found like at least a couple of months which is very typical of russia that's like what they do they like to break in and hang out and just like spy on people for a while um yeah i mean I th is it is it just me because i think that we need to start making systems on the assumption that there's they're crawling with bots yeah absolutely and like you know obviously working in the field it's just like oh this is like not fucking surprising at all um <laughs> you know it's really interesting because someone at work mentioned to me he used to be in the military he was like yeah like you know when there's like a lot of military activity the uh they'll degrade the networks and like definitely like, one thing i noticed is um when there's military activity just I guess like I don't know like specifically what I think right. one thing he mentioned was like trying to fuck with like the GPS like system so like making it less accurate and stuff like that um but one thing I did notice at the beginning of COVID was every time I went on the subway it would suddenly be like 3G when I was going downtown and I'm so like you know it's, it's really not surprising <laughs> like to me as someone working in the field um yeah, like of throttling and everything yeah exactly and um there was something else that was sign oh yeah the google outage like a couple of days ago oh, yeah 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 i mean like that's not it wasn't a huge long outage but it's still pretty significant like because it's google like that's that's you know they have their own cloud and stuff like that so it's pretty it's pretty hefty yeah they, they have their own cloud just like god yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> they still fuck things up exactly <laughs> So that's, is that, um, was that a lot of stress for you at work? All those issues, do those impact your day-to-day um, -day security work? Personally, not. So I'm lucky in that way because I do um, offensive security. So oh. um, for anyone who's watching and yeah, doesn't know that. that class. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's basically like my job is to like emulate an attacker rather than like defend. So my job is just breaking into shit. Um, and so it didn't really affect like it, 
you know, if my clients themselves aren't being affected, then it doesn't really affect my day to day. But uh, there, it was interesting though, because on Twitter, the job market was like when the solar winds like shit went down. Mm-hmm. The job market was like fucking on fire all of a sudden. <laughs> okay, so so, uh, so let, let, let me let me run a kind of a half baked idea by you that I had last night. I mean, uh, the, the the part last night is at the end of this sequence of ideas. Okay, so um, theoretically we have a fair system where there's one person, one vote, and this other system in parallel where one person can have more money than someone else. So as much as you can vote with your wallet, that's different than voting with your votes, supposedly, because Mm -hmm. it's one person, one vote. Uh, Whereas with money, you know, income inequality, wealth inequality could be, who knows what it could be, there's no built in limit on wealth inequality. I mean, um, especially given that the tax rates can be changed and so on. Anyway, so like, Given that, um, you know, because you know, with with Bitcoin, it solved the double spend problem by creating this scarcity of Bitcoin. Because if money is just a file and you can copy files because of digital abundance, it's cheap to copy files, then it's hard to represent money with a file until they use all the encryption, everything to solve the double spend problem. Okay, anyway, so they had to do that to create a scarcity to make it seem like it was expensive to copy files, basically. Yeah, yeah, Um, totally. But I was thinking about one actual scarcity we do have is IP4 uh, addresses, IP yes. address from IPv4 version four. So I was thinking, well, why not just have a system where it's one IP address, one vote? And you could say, well, there's going to be inequality. It's like, yeah, but there is anyway, because in reality, you can buy votes. Like, that's the whole mm-hmm. problem. It's not actually like, like, oh, my God, we're going to have a, like, a, it's probably less unequal to have one IP address, one vote, than one dollar, one vote, which is what it ends up being if you can buy the votes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Um, I mean, they'd have to catch up and figure out how to buy the IP addresses. It might be cat and mouse. I mean, yeah, so I'm thinking of like, what's the simplest possible way that the whole world can just vote on, on things without, because obviously security is big thing, like, oh, validating the voters and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, but like, we should also see what the bots say just out of curiosity, right? Just as an empirical question, what, what do, even if you just count all the votes later, if you don't even allow the bots in the system, you'll never get the data on how they behave in a voting system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, so okay, so the bots and study them. And there's an XKCD about this, right? The the um the issue with that is that I don't. So with IPv6, I actually don't know if they're. There's a lot I can't more. remember if they're planning to like give every single device like an IP address or if it's still like the IPv4 um like structure. But the way IPv4 is set up is that um we have these blocks of like public IP addresses. So these are the ones like, you know, corporations can buy like a public IP address. But like, if you're talking about citizens. um, And by the the way, the the, the half-baked idea that I, that how I started thinking this, I I, I was curious if the number of IP4 addresses was smaller or bigger than the human population. Oh, it's it's absolutely, um, it's it's smaller. Yeah, we're like already running out. And the thing, so the thing is like with IPv4, we have this concept of private addresses. So this is like the same blocks of IP addresses that everyone use. Um, so in your home network, you have like a router at the edge. Yeah. So that will have a public IP address, but every single device in your house will be on this pu- this private IP address. So for most people, like all of their devices will be like 192.168.1.1. Um, and then if they have a phone, it's like, you know, 192.168.1.2 kind of thing. But it's not like so, crazier than the electoral college, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. the states don't get equal number of votes in the first place you know like so like yeah there would be it would create it would create some it would be gameable and it would create a game that someone could game and it, you know it could just be for something that's advisory not necessarily for like binding legal things but like you know like there's lots of online polls that are gamed i mean just look at the new york times giving hillary clinton a 98 percent chance of victory i mean like and if that if that was in game to tell me how that happened i got <laughs> <laughs> for sure totally gamed you know so it's like but so if we assume that all systems can be gamed, the question isn't how, what do you do to make this theoretically pure system that can never be contaminated by any gaming or any voter fraud? This is kind of the debate happening in the US right now of like, you do voter fraud, no, you do voter fraud. Well, you're impure, so you're impure. Like, okay, mm-hmm. but like, if, if you're gonna make a system and it's going to be gameable, what game is a better game to play, right? Like yeah, in what sure. way do you want people to be trying to game the system? And like, m- maybe if people were tracking IP addresses, it would create a bit of a dissociation from the money in politics is maybe IP addresses would be a different resource, you know? Yeah, for sure. Like it's definitely an interesting concept. I wouldn't, so I wasn't trying to say that like it's gameable. It's more that like the inherent infrastructure of IPv4, like it doesn't, 
it's not proportional to the amount of devices you have like right. the fact like let's say because like what's coming to me right now you're saying like gaming the system so like you know if you're rich you would buy like 50 phones and then that's like 50 votes or whatever well you know you could, um, you, you could average the vote for the ip so suppose uh, you and i have the same uh, where we share uh internet next we're next door neighbors and share internet and so we're both on the same ip address and um so suppose we both vote and like you vote against a bill that's like proposed federally in Canada and oh, I vote for a I bill, see, see. you could divide it. So it just be, but but one IP address would count for one vote worth. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. So it's like, like you would be submitting like a fraction of like a vote, like combined between like the two neighbors. That's yeah, interesting. I mean, I, I do think it would be pretty easy for people to spoof your IP address. Um, but, you know, they, they, they can't just spoof no IP address in particular. Like they can't just sort of like, put an arbitrary like like the ip address is only worth so much when, when they spoof it and, and and people could look at the records in some versions you know not the smallest possible version but mm -hmm. one that kept logs people could look and be like who is this voting and with my ip address you know um mm -hmm. like that would be a slightly more because i'm trying to think of like progressive security of how you start with something that like is as simple as possible because bitcoin did this right bitcoin said fuck security except for the double spend problem like, like privacy there's no privacy built into bitcoin and you know yeah. so they're like let's just solve one problem and let other people figure out security in, pr in stages, which is kind of what's mm -hmm. happened. Like they've made the more privacy coins and so on. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking something like that could happen with online voting systems. Not that there aren't probably some projects that are trying this, but. Yeah, there's definitely like, there. there's lots of projects that, like trying to tokenize just like, just about everything. Cause the thing is like the concept of blockchain makes sense, right? Like it's, yeah. if we can figure out how to do this in a way that's, you know, not going to compromise privacy in a way that we're, but, um, we but, can you know, tie the physical layer to like the logical layer. So it's like, you know, like one person is definitively like one node on the network, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so like I've seen it with like, well, not seen it, but like the the hypotheses I've seen are like, you know, with healthcare um, as well as with um, like energy as well. So tokenizing like the exchange of like um, sort of like how much energy you're putting out and like how much that's worth on like a, you know, smart grid kind of thing. Yeah, but, you know, um, I, I do worry that decentralized projects, because they're universally now making tokens for their decentralized software projects, that opens up the whole sector to a, a kind of a biodiversity problem that they could all be regulated in one fell swoop by regulating all tokens. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and whereas, you know, it would be a different matter to regulate all possible decentralized software applications. What would be so different about like that with software? Well, legislators get the analogy with money. I mean, look look how quickly they cracked down on Libra with Facebook. They were like, oh, no, you don't. We know exactly who to deliver the letter to. We can't find Satoshi Nakamoto, but we can find Mark Zuckerberg. Yep. And no, you're not having your own currency to compete with the US dollar. They just said like, you can't do this because you're competing with us. That's basically what it said. They're like, you're not allowed to compete with us. The end of the story. Like, if mm -hmm. we, And so if they could do that to Bitcoin, they would. If the US dollar and friends could just say, Dear Bitcoin, you don't exist. If they could do that with one letter tomorrow, they would probably do it, but they can't because it's it's decentralized. But they can start regulating cryptocurrency a lot, like various countries have tried to make it illegal and whatnot. And you can mm -hmm. go after yeah. using currencies that don't go that don't go through the central bank. Um, yeah, for sure. It's interesting too because, like, you know, they can't do that in a lot of cases. So now they're just you know hopping on the bandwagon. It's like you know every bank has like its blockchain research like facility or whatever and like you know obviously china we all know is like co-opted bitcoin as much as it can kind of thing so i mean it's they don't also regulate voting like the my understanding is that um later i should have clinton debergoski on here to explain this but my understanding is that with the indian act in canada there's a, a prohibition of uh, the various reserves forming a federal level organization of decision making mm -hmm. um so that they, they do also regulate voting like money and voting are things that states might be inclined to regulate and say like this is you're not supposed to offer an alternative we're, we're supposed mm -hmm. to have a monopoly basically which is how we get into a state that doesn't change enough for what we're yeah, doing, yeah, like absolutely. climate change etc um yeah that's, that's the rough line of thinking yeah <laughs> uh, i was gonna say something hold on let me let me think yeah. for a second um oh yeah okay so it's interesting with voting too though because like you know, you take a look at, let's say, the DNC hack, like, in the last election, um, and there's definitely, like, obviously the aspect of, like, yes, the county and the votes and whatever, but honestly, like, I feel, I mean, I did a whole project on this, so it's 
mm. pretty easy to have this bias but like I feel that the um the psychological like influence aspect is honestly way more um what would you say like attractive for an adversary than like the Cambridge Analytica and so on yeah absolutely um and that's literally how you know they conjecture that Trump won in the last election um all of the so like if you actually like look at like sort of the analysis on the things that Russia did um there was very very little of actually hacking the systems in the end right. of the day um they did break into like some of the DNC servers and stuff like that um but there wasn't like manipulation of the actual numbers there was the Podesta emails so they like released those and kept releasing more and that was really just more like a loss of faith kind of like attack um they also where are the other couple ones there was like they bought targeted ads in like swing states where like you know they were like people were kind of in the middle not really sure what they wanted and just like targeted a lot of like right wing um ads in those areas different ads they, to different voters so they didn't exactly. have, to have a consistent message they didn't have that, that yeah that fairness condition of the light of day of like say the same thing to everybody and what does it mean yeah and actually the biggest one which still still plagues us like now is black lives matter like they 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 didn't even change the black lives matter dialogue they just amplified it because they knew it was divisive and that was the thing it was like you you create the rift make it bigger and then you have like you know the other like propaganda coming from the other sources to you know like like influence people psychologically to one side um, it, does, it does seem like there's a general trend of some kind of technological amplification of things that are divisive and like like the the innocent explanation is whoops we were just optimizing for engagement because we're good capitalists and we're like serving our bottom line and our shareholders so we were optimizing our engagement because that's good for profit because we have to become a monopoly to make lots of money and how else do you do it exactly. and <laughs> we, we're obligated to make as much as possible guys we gotta squash all this competition let's buy instagram etc when nobody even knew what it was yet uh, in, above a certain age bracket because yeah, but they had the demographics they were doing the data they're like oh we need to buy this one just like you know they started with the Harvard network and worked down they're like well we have to make sure we don't like miss any networks they're not worried about like how much money the product's making at the moment or anything like that they're just trying it's a strategy of control of like network yeah. control um what was I talking about why was every <laughs> uh, <laughs> what did you just say I don't know whatever is improv but yeah oh, I mean the, like, the, the uh, well the psychological yeah the psychological control. um yeah because you know, like our, our our sense of voting security, it's security theater a lot like 9-11 because of the focus on like, oh, the voting machines and so on. And it's like, you know, like, 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 like people hacking your mind is a lot harder to deal with in a sense. Yeah. Because oh, I, I was saying there's, there's, so there's a general trend of divisive things. So like the innocent explanation is Facebook saying, oh, we're just optimizing for engagement. Um, but you might say, well, there's probably third parties that want division in any country you know that for any country mm -hmm. there is probably someone on the planet who wishes that country was more divided absolutely I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of a cynical initial frame but um i mean i mean something seemed a little naive you know you'll hear people say this now about the initial idea of facebook we're just connecting the world it's like okay let's connect all your neurons and see what happens to you you know like yeah you'll be the same person all right <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly but yeah it's um it's, it's interesting because like in in cyber warfare studies like the biggest problem in cyber warfare is what is it <laughs> and that is the debate it's like you know we don't have this tangible like aspect of like you got to like blow something up for it to be cyber warfare or maybe not cyber warfare um and so you know the things like the psychological influence um you know the propaganda the espionage is sort of the focus of a lot of it um the only thing it really stops short of is like you know, we haven't seen like, let's say a hacker blow up like a power plant or like something like that yet. Um, we've gone pretty close with Stuxnet, like, you know, they damaged like the centrifuges um, in uh, in Iran, um, but it wasn't like, you know, damage in terms of like, you're causing like explosions or like, you know, causing lethal, like direct harm to people or like anything like that. Um, so, yeah, it was very yeah. surgical in a way. I mean, it was very blunt force, the fact that they spread Stuxnet to the whole world just to get it into those factories. Those, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, facilities. That's where I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, made the centrifuges spin the wrong way. So imagine someone could make you spin your centrifuges the wrong way just by distributing a meme to the whole earth. <laughs> I feel like that. I don't know. Uh, oh.
so I mean, what do you think? Um, because I don't want to go down on the rabbit hole of just being like, yeah, Black Lives Matter is divisive. That's you know, because clearly, clearly there would have been a healthier way for that topic to because cl clearly it should have that kind of urgency, which is why people accept yeah. that media narrative. It's like, okay, we're all sitting around, let's deal with this problem. It's like right on your doorstep. So, like, what's the issue? You know, like, well, why, why can we not solve this kind of thing? And as you say, it, a lot of it did become divisive, which isn't to say that like the solution won't also be divisive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So like there. there's healthy division that that leads that leads to some kind of progress and then there's unhealthy division, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I always like like I came across these videos talking about like, you know, there's usually like a war every 50 to 100 years and like we're kind of like due for one. So that's kind of depressing. Um trying to like prophecy. Yeah, fuck. Um, the of the world. Yeah. I was actually just looking up like a couple minutes ago uh the characteristics of a cold war because mm -hmm. i was like you know a lot of people have like so, sort of jokingly said yeah like this is like a cold war and um you know i've always had that thought too like when cold COVID war with us and russia you mean yeah yeah and, and, also, like, and there's china. A cold... sorry oh. and china as well right right okay and it's also like there's a cold civil war in the us yeah yeah definitely and um it was interesting because like one of the main characteristics that they listed was like the nuclear threat, which like, I guess to some degree, we kind of had that earlier in the year, but like um, now like the threat is like, you just, you just don't know what the fuck they're going to do with like, you know, hackers hacking into shit and whatever. Um, oh, cause, so, cause it's not in the nation's interest, but some random crazy person might think it's in their interest if they can hack into this or that. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely that. I mean, like there are, I guess on, for the most part, like it wouldn't be in another nation's interest to like let's say blow up like a power plant or something but it definitely is in their interest to like do a show of force which like that the cat try to blow up a power plant at the end yeah <laughs> I don't know. I don't show that part. <laughs> and in a way oh, yeah. it, they have done that in the last i can't remember if it was last year or the year before that but like there was fully like an attack on a like a like a power grid in the u.s by russia or something um and like that was like a big thing, but it was just like more like a shutdown kind of thing, like not like a explosion. Um, and I mean, like you know, Russia and Ukraine, there's like that kind of shit going on like all the fucking time. Um, so what, do you what was I gonna say there? Oh yeah, right. Okay, so I was like looking it up though because it brought me back to college, which is when I was like really doing all, a lot of this research. And um, one of the questions I actually originally had like way back in like my second or third year was like, how does cyber warfare affect like the role of women in warfare? Right. And I saw, I literally just came across this article like an hour or two ago. It was about um, this woman who had like an OnlyFans and it blew up to like, you know, five times like the income she was getting uh, because like some like military like person, I don't know, made some like, like, thirsty comment or something and then somehow that like led to a bunch of like other military people like following her and only fans and like it was just crazy and i was just like oh my gosh like i i like made this like just sort of like casual hypothesis a while ago about you know like the digital cold war or as someone else suggested me the term cool war because it's almost like a almost like a diluted cold war um cold war. yeah and i was like yeah this is like you know the sex work that happened in like the times of war is just now moving online like this is literally mm -hmm. what's, what's going on so yeah it's a really interesting like dynamic to like watch it okay so know. here's your here's our next screenplay hacker hacks people's credit card numbers purchases sex work and then gets hacked by the sex worker <laughs> <laughs> damn or there i don't know you need, need another dimension of complexity to the narrative <laughs> I mean, like, that's a pretty stupid. fucking good basis, like, not gonna lie. I have no idea how to write a screenplay. I've never done that. <laughs> I guess now is the time to learn. Fuck. <laughs> I suppose. Have you ever used this um, this thing yet? Um, AI Dungeon, which uses GPT-3? No, I, I don't know. AI help you write a screenplay? Because it'll just copy the format of text you start with. So if you start, like, a monologue, it'll continue, like, a monologue. But if you start, like, a dialogue, it'll try to continue the dialogue, and it'll sometimes, like, add a third character in. And so, that's so crazy whoa okay yeah, that's so like because so like um gpt3 it's probably like our i forget what by which metric it's the biggest ai there's some metric maybe the largest data set from public sources or something like that by some metric it's if not the biggest one of the biggest ais in terms of like sheer brute force i guess 
Um, not to mention, you know, the algorithms are not bad, I guess, but you know, you know how it is. It, like AIs need so much more data than we do and so much more electricity than we do. They're still yeah, yeah. inefficient, but you don't have to pay them in the same amount. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, yeah, so GPT-3 is the first one. GPT-2 you could download and fit on your computer, but GPT-3, that's kind of impossible to do. Okay. Um, maybe for most people and also like maybe use a different kind of database or something anyway um yeah so it's it's kind of like the most advanced like text completion ai in a sense and yeah. uh, but it's only licensed currently to certain parties but this game ai dungeon has it licensed so oh, if you nice. go into their custom mode you're basically using gpt3 fairly <laughs> directly like they i don't know how much programming the, the custom mode i don't know how much connection how many how, like how many lines of code really connect the two like yeah yeah many, that's yeah. that's really insane though that's crazy um An ai dungeon is where you, you use it it's pretty crazy i mean you can use it to like generate quotes in the style of historical figures i i, I set up a narrative to get it to generate an emma goldman quote and the emma goldman quote it generated was uh something like i have been a, a woman i have been a woman of many loves but it is not like me to go through life with an open heart and a closed mouth <laughs> <laughs> that's the ai hey the ai got you know not too far off better than i would have done <laughs> yeah that's amazing oh my gosh you know i definitely ai research is sort of like one of the next things i'm like definitely eyeing so i definitely gotta check that out what um, is ai generally oh no oh just like i was just saying that like i want to research it and like just sort of delve into like the security side of it the security side of ai yeah or script writing <laughs> <laughs> i mean there's scripts and script kitties in both cases exactly oh my gosh <laughs> but yeah it's interesting so the the gbd2 like i mean i guess you could host it in the cloud too if you can't put it on your computer that's like an option it's not that expensive these days uh yeah i think you could host gbt2 for other parties but gbt3 is only via like api license i think at the moment that and actually sense. there's a bit of a controversy because it's like an open foundation that's made this kind of closed off ai but with GPT-3, they actually warned people they were releasing it before they released it, saying, like, you have to, like, beef up your security for certain purposes because, like, this AI is, like, that much better that, like, it might start fooling your various Turing tests or whatever. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious. Yeah, oh so God. they gave people, like, an advance warning. It reminds me of when Q first showed the Enterprise the Borg, and, like, you're going to fight this empire in, like, a few seasons kind of thing. <laughs> So actually, it's funny too, uh, like literally today, like a couple hours ago, I was scrolling through Facebook and I got an ad for, it was a voucher to rent one minute of a quantum, and I was just like, one minute of what? This is rent a quantum computer for like a minute. Oh, right, right, right. It was like a voucher for it. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is like the future, man. This is hilarious. I'm just getting like casual Facebook ads about this now. <laughs> yeah, so, the, so the thing is like as ai becomes more powerful i mean this is related to the I, ip address voting thing because as, as ai gets more powerful there's more power held by those with more compute power which you can buy with money um but you cut out for a second invest their money in computing huh? hold on hold on you cut out for a second i missed like oh. the beginning of that sentence oh i just just saying that it creates as ai gets more powerful in the future what matters is who has more compute power yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's becoming controlled by centralized organizations. Like, as you said, Google has its own cloud, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, the people don't really have a good cloud. I mean, there are clouds that are public, but, you know, it's not like there isn't one that like the government is funding, everybody is using and like is a competitor to all of the, it's kind of like how um, in the US, there aren't huge uh, worker managed cooperatives. Like in Spain, there's a very big one, the Mondragon co-op, but in the US, it's not a thing. It's like market conditions currently contingently are that you know uh, hierarchical corporations have the market but that's not a necessary feature like co-ops are are legal and it would be legal to have more public clouds as well like have mm -hmm. the government fund them you know like in taiwan the government commissions software for political purposes but it, it, it's too much is left of the free market in america i don't know the land of the free is that's certain got the wrong definition of freedom slightly i think yeah yeah and i mean like there's no fucking way like any you know public like small grassroots cloud is going to catch up um with any of these like monopolies like they're the amount of insane like you know replication they have and like like the security they have and like the ability to market like different you know services and stuff like that is just like it's astronomical it's insane like well i don't know i was just thinking i wanted to look up what the current numbers are for how powerful things like folding at home are compared to like private supercomputers 
because that that would be the hope that these decentralized projects because i was thinking about how SETI at home shut down because they said uh they had enough they, they were like we have enough we need to like figure out we just i think they're saying they're going to change how they analyze the data in the first place or something like that or or maybe it's not as economical now for them to farm it out maybe that's mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of the issue um i still want to know how SETI accounts for the idea that theoretically other um theoretically most of the logically possible civilizations out there would live through time in a different order so if you're scanning the, the sky for messages assuming that aliens don't have time travel or whatever don't have time differences um you know i i, I don't know <laughs> i want to know how they would account for that in their in their mathematics you know like how do you do you just like scramble everything and see if you can find a message in any possible order or do they not do that <laughs> I don't there, know. There would be a different answer to the Fermi paradox, right? Like, if the universe is so big, why is it so hard to find aliens? Maybe because the space of possible ways you could live through time is also big. So, mostly aliens don't live through time in the same order as us. Yeah, like that's definitely like a concept that's that, like, I've been thinking about a lot. Um, the Fermi paradox? No, the, the whole just like, why are there, why haven't we found ETs yet? Because, like, we can look into space and shit. Although, it's been that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know, like the the definition. Yeah. Of that's, well, that's the that's the that's how you can find the wiki on it or whatever. It's it's um it's that question of the universe is big, so why haven't we found aliens? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they don't seem to match these two things, like the sheer size versus the sheer lack of any sign of any aliens anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, we're wired to expect like the Earth. You just kind of look around and you're like, oh look, there's rabbits, you know, but we're part of the same tree of life. We're not actually looking at another tree. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because then you have to get into the definition of like what is an alien. Like there might there's microbes, like I'm sure, on other planets and shit. Like is that what we're like, you know, classifying as aliens? Like it could be like fucking anything. Um, well, yeah, an evolution could be happening on some completely different level. Like there's like various theories of like evolution. There's one theory of like universes evolving over time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Organisms. Like oh, maybe that's the maybe the nearest alien is like the species of universes themselves that we inhabit. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We just happen to evolve inside one universe of a, an organism made out of a tree of different universes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of things are possible. It's very hard. To, that's the thing with metaphysics. There's like very little constraint on what is true, which is why when yeah. like a certain metaphysics gets really popular, I usually look for what the political implications or motivations are because there isn't really a constraint. It's kind of like, you know, you, you could believe many worlds. You could believe this is a simulation or you could believe that there's only one. You could believe determinism. You could believe free will. There's nothing forcing you anything so like mm -hmm. if, if you start to feel forced um you know i don't think these are decided questions of philosophy i think it ends up being more a matter of fashion so like when the simulation argument is really popular uh, it, it encourages a kind of throwaway society i think and it's it's a way of reducing that cognitive dissonance of having a throwaway society of like oh don't worry it's just a simulation ps we're also going to go to the moon like no we got a backup and we got like a the backup of the system and it's backup because like this is all a simulation like don't, like, don't worry we have a backup and also this and the backup are a simulation because <laughs> like That's why the same people yeah. into the moon and the simulation hypothesis like what's the connection there can't be no psychological connection it's not just like yeah they're just curious about metaphysics and they realize this is the truth and now it's part it's part of their worldview it's like mm, I, that's, that's not psychologically realistic at all yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's also i mean like there's also the theories of you know maybe there's aliens and they are around and like they just aren't letting us see them which is why you know they? makes sense because it's like I mean, similar to the from people <laughs> yeah well like similar to the simulation theory though it's like, <clears throat> like what would happen if like everyone knew there was like definitively like aliens right now and it's like well there would probably be mass anarchy because it's just like oh there's like this force that is more powerful than us like nothing matters anymore right um i feel like mm -hmm. that's like, at least like especially in the sort of sort of like emotional vulnerability that exists right now i feel like that's definitely you know well i expect people would cluster into different groups according to how they responded to the aliens not say according to how they responded to donald trump or justin trudeau that's, that's fair too yeah i mean like there'd be the pro probably, aliens and the, the people who want to fight the aliens yeah there's people who like you know al like had already thought there were aliens anyways and it doesn't really change your lives you know etc cetera, etc cetera, so i mean personally i buy the theory that a lot a lot of tales of alien abduction are repressed uh, memories of abuse and trauma yeah that's an interesting theory um i mean it's not that far off from what freud was discovering you know looking mm -hmm. into the unknown you know yeah yeah for sure yeah, even though freud was it seems like freud was forced to recant later in life and say that a lot of people were making things up but i imagine um there, there's um 
uh, there's an article I think by uh, Solnit on this about how basically it seems like powerful influences forced Freud to recant and be like, oh no, it's not that common. Like you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people are because it, it, it seems it seems strange to hard to explain otherwise. At any rate, like people also interpret other weird experiences in terms of aliens, not just repressed memories. Like there, you know, um, have you heard of Michael Persinger's God Helmet? Uh, no. So he's a researcher at Laurentian, and he claims to be able to induce religious experiences by pointing magnetic waves at people's head, basically using this thing called the God Helmet. Mm -hmm. uh, he claims that uh, basically there has to be certain types of patterns for it to work, like not just any old electromagnetic waves. But, you know, given that, you know, brainwave entrainment is a real thing, this could be, have some kind of effect. But what he claims to have found, although there isn't a lot of replication of his work, but what he claims to have found is that um, when people have this uh, disrupted experience, uh, religious people will interpret it as a religious experience, but a lot of um, sort of secular Americans will interpret it as aliens. Mm. Um, and he said that the experience um, ha has supposed to have some of the features of religious experience, like a sense presence that's familiar, but also other. And his suggested explanation is that in the human brain, each hemisphere has a sense of self, but normally at any given moment, one of them is sort of dominant over the other so that we have like a who's in charge here like what's and maybe it changes or something but there's a there, there's a one there's a one sense of self that emerges and he says that with these magnetic experiences or maybe other experiences although he claims this might explain haunted houses where there's a magnetic field stronger from the earth or something but he says that basically it disrupts that so that both hemispheres have a sense of self at the same time so mm -hmm. the left hemisphere is like aware of the right hemisphere as like a separate being and that can feel like, especially from the left to the right, I guess that could seem like you're talking to God, like these intuitions just like give you like, here's, cause if, if you ever, if you've ever thought of a sentence intuitively, it's like, where did that sentence come from? Well, you're maybe yeah. from your right hemisphere through your bottleneck. I mean, although supposedly the, the, there's supposedly there's a gender difference that women have more connections there. I don't know if that would, I don't know if that's borne out into the day on religious experience, mind you, maybe, you know, maybe, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know if one gender is more prone to claim religious experience in the first place. I can, I mean, like, in terms of just, like, the way emotions and thoughts are processed, I can definitely see that, like, maybe one of, one of the types is, you know, more, more leaning towards, like, that, just because, um, it's interesting, because I've, I've talked to people who, like, you know, t like, started transitioning and taking hormones, and it's, like, they, they said that their thought processes, like, their ability to have emotions, like, totally changes, um, and it's really interesting because like, a lot of the dialogue is like, oh, well, like, you know, gender and sex are separate, which like I do believe, but there's also this aspect of like, there's a very, you know, granular interaction happening on a hormonal level that influences these kind of things. Um, there's also a really interesting thing I watched uh, recently where they were talking about how these different like sort of mystical experiences, if you want to say that, um, happen like for different types of brains and the one like thing that really stuck out was they were talking about how you know the, you know the thing where there's like the people who can't like visualize an object and then there's like people who like don't have like thoughts like like a voice in their head kind of thing um they're saying like people without voices in their head tend to more strongly interpret um these sorts of experiences as like a god seeing experience or whatever because it's like I guess they don't have like the rational sort of I shouldn't say rational but they don't have like the the thought process in their head saying like this might be me or something right um mm. right so yeah I feel like there's so many layers like both on a physical la layer but then also like the psychological like you know what are you even how do you actually like perceive things with your senses and like what you know which like dials of your senses like fluctuate yeah I mean there's room for some agnosticism of course about like the fundamental structure of reality so you might because like th there's um, a common criticism that you'll see come from analytic philosophy towards continental philosophy is saying like well that's nice what you're talking about but it's not metaphysics you're just describing human psychology and in fact taken as human psychology continental philosophy can be very useful um, <laughs> but not all those philosophers in all those cases would have agreed this is not metaphysics they would say because we don't actually know how much of the world is determined by our psychology like like the current scientific hypothesis is that it, it's, it works kind of the other way around and that could be true but it's like it's far from proven like like <laughs> like i you could you know like like for instance with quantum physics there's a because people think that quantum physics proves that the universe splits or something like that the many worlds it's like no that's just one interpretation there's a deter there's a way of looking at quantum physics that's deterministic and there's a way of looking at that it's non-deterministic 
and so it doesn't settle anything. It just, it's just yeah. <laughs> style, a theory. And, and you know, running the theory on a different architecture, it might flip the order of which one's more efficient, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're trying to run a theory in our heads to, you know, in traditional and on paper in traditional science to like get predictions. And then a computer comes along and might, you know, like a, a CPU versus GPU, different algorithms run good on one versus the other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the quantum physics thing is really, like from a philosophical perspective for me personally, it's been really interesting because um, I've seen it like I've always sort of seen it in my head like as like this concept of like merging duality where like, you know, we had this very concrete like digital is like zero or one and now quantum mechanics is like, oh, it's like a probability of like, you know, somewhere in between zero or one. Um, and I feel like in like that's it manifests in, you know, like all of the patterns that exist like in the universe where like part of COVID in my opinion is like literally experiencing that like merge um you know we're literally like observing quantum mechanics and that has an effect on like the collective sort of like perception of like what existence is and it's really funny too I was like on LinkedIn this was like a couple months ago and um I got tagged in this post that was talking about quantum mechanics and um the people in the comments like we're like, oh my gosh, like, I feel like this is going to be like, you know, like a spiritual breakthrough for like the entire world and stuff. And this is on like LinkedIn, like this is not like Facebook or some shit. This is like on a, like a fucking corporate platform. Oh, I so it. I don't like, I don't know what the explanation is, but like, it's, there's like, it's doing something to people. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, if, if I may um, keep doing the move of like reducing something to psychology and politics, <laughs> um, I, I, I think. <laughs> It, I mean, it's just the reflex I have at the moment, I don't know, but, um, um, you, you know, like, as with the simulation problem, I think being motivated by a, a certain psychological starting point of, of um, cognitive dissonance about how we're treating the world, mm -hmm. um, like, oh, well, but, but it's okay, it's just a simulation, or it's okay, we're going to go to Mars, or, or, or other things like that, um, or it's okay, we'll, we'll, like, you know, somehow pass basic income and, like, maintain this simulation of privilege for everybody or something like that um so and so there's and with quantum physics there's i think different psychological motivations sometimes people want to hear the opposite they want to hear your decisions make a difference but they do even if quantum physics isn't true that's the thing yeah yeah it's like that's the <laughs> and somehow, suddenly what else is true even if quantum physics is wrong is that observing something does change the outcome mm-hmm like asking somebody um, their opinion of you changes their opinion of you, mm -hmm. right? If you just say like, what do you think of like, am I, am I great? Tell me, you know, they're like, mm, not so much. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> like, why are you asking? That's not a great question. Yeah, yeah, right? no, you're absolutely. Better people would ask a better question. Why, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> you're not better anymore. No, but that's that. not quantum physics. <laughs> but I think that's what a lot of people as like the social phenomenon of like, wow, quantum physics. I think what they're saying is like, look, even physicists think that could happen. So I'm not crazy to think that it happens in the social world. Mm -hmm. I, I can make a difference and observing things does change the outcome. Um, you know, I do think it's a healthier, to me, it comes down to a question of choosing a religious metaphor. Because if you like worship determinism, then that supports a kind of passivity of like, well, I'll mind my own business, let this business do, corporation do what it wants. I'll just, you know, work about my bottom line. I, I learned, <laughs> I, I was explained to Rosie what Snapple was. So we looked up some Snapple facts that they put on the, the lid and because they know Snapple in England. And, um, okay, okay. huh? Yeah, okay, no, I was just saying, okay. Uh, <laughs> and um, one of the facts that we learned from Snapple's quote unquote real facts is that the first, this is because they listed on the Wikipedia, is that the first penny in the US had the motto, mind your own business. <laughs> that's amazing what <laughs> and you know like um i don't think the quantum physics woo movement is exactly the same as mind your own business right it, it's, it's no, like yeah. we're all connected and it's like mm -hmm. yeah we are but we don't need to be connected through a fallacy that quantum physics needs to be true to give this view legitimacy because it's basically working under this model of like a, a kind of science authoritarianism like if we can get physics to say it then we're safe because physics trumps these other fields mm -hmm. so if we can appeal to physics then that protects us from claiming these uh, the other claims that say no we're all disconnected nothing you do makes a difference and like we can study you without changing you 
um, you know, like, and therefore the results of studies are, are accurate, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. As, as yeah, opposed solve. to what you think intuitively, which is another sort of source of information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's, it's all, it, you see what I mean? In attempting to reduce it to psychology and politics, that's how I'm inclined to see these things. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's fair, like it's, um, it's needed, if anything. I mean, there's so many like buzzwords with like fucking everything right now. Even like it's it's actually really interesting because I've been just like you know watching like the sort of new age like stuff come up on my feeds and you know I've been like just watching it just to like I, I love just watching everything like I'll just fucking follow everything just to like watch like how it progresses and they're all like getting on this like oh yeah like quantum everything blah 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 and it's um it's interesting because like what you're exactly saying it's like I don't know if they like necessarily understand like what it is or like if it's just you know like I, I'm, I'm wondering if they'll end up like cold fusion where it's possible in principle but in practice it doesn't turn mm -hmm. out to make such a huge savings like like there, there's there's few enough quantum computers right now that for all i know it could be like a scam like like do you know how the um um elizabeth holmes uh scandal went down with the fraudulent devices for medical tests oh no i haven't heard about that oh yeah there's a documentary about it basically she was claiming to be starting this corporation to make these devices that would give you really rapid medical testing and a lot of them it didn't work properly mm. um, and basically it's not clear that they were ever going to work because it had like sort of um lofty constraints on the solution that made it according to people that consulted with her early on not possible and but she didn't want to hear that apparently and so they basically, because her vision was like, no, we must make this product that works under these constraints. They basically ended up with a fraudulent product. <laughs> it's good that they got found out before COVID because they'd be offering fraudulent COVID tests right now with their like miracle technology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So basically, now now suppose suppose those consultants were academic, like the academics she consulted with were a little off, and actually it was possible. Um, you know, but it, but it wasn't actually, but, but they didn't actually achieve it, even though it was possible. So they did fraud instead. Yeah, yeah. And so you could imagine quantum computing teams doing that, be like, okay, or, or cold fusion, be like, okay, in principle, we could use quantum physics to like, you know, compute things at a lower cost. So basically, we have to save money. Um, <laughs> right. But there's lots of, you know, like Ponzi schemes and all sorts of scandals where it's like, this claim that we had an investment that was going to pay off is, is hidden somehow um i mean it's hidden the fact that that's not true is hidden somehow um so like you know because you could buy that quantum time and, and like like do you really know that they're doing it efficiently because with the, with with the elizabeth, elizabeth holmes scandal they would uh claim to be doing them in store but farm it out to another company because their device wasn't working properly yeah yeah no that's totally a good point because like I mean, fuck, they could be just not even using a quantum computer at all. Like, you know, what's the proof that they yeah, are? Yeah, because they could say like, oh yeah, we did it for you in four seconds, but you had to wait in line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, yeah, I guess these quantum computers are popular. They're so mm -hmm. slow, they must be really popular. I should invest. <laughs> yeah, it's I'm a skeptical, skeptical guy, I guess. I don't know. But I, I do hope that quantum encryption makes encryption a lot more unbreakable. Like that would be great for activism. Yeah, that's obviously the biggest thing. And like, you know, there's a lot of like movement right now to figure out the security layer, not just on like quantum physics, but or quantum computing, but like everything in that chain where it's like, you know, it's like AI, like blockchain, IoT, 5G, um, cloud, all just merging together. Because if we do this, like, you know, without figuring that out, it's going to be a fucking disaster. Unless, like, there's some weird moral awakening where, like, everyone decides, oh, they're not going to be assholes to each other. But, I don't know, I'm a fucking <laughs> skeptical-ass human, so, like, <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, um, yeah, I mean, that was kind of what Russell Brand was trying to say was, you know, we're all going to have some emotional awakening and become super empathic, and that's what has to happen to, like, stop climate change or something. And I don't know. I feel like what's more realistic is people figuring out what to hate. Because people yeah. are have these negative emotions, it looks like. So, what should they be aimed at? You know, like, um, I mean, some people say that's why Occupy was shut down because it had the right target in terms of wealth inequality. Because um, mm. I mean, a lot, a lot of these, like in any interview that Chomsky does, he goes through the doomsday problems that they have for the doomsday clock. That's like we're this many minutes from midnight, so it's like nuclear weapons, 
and uh, well, now with pandemics, I don't know if they haven't had it on there before, but I mean, I, I guess we're not, that, that's not like threatening complete extinction as easily. Maybe it could, but I think, I think that's a more so mass death, but nuclear weapons, I think are more responsible for moving the needle towards midnight on the doom. Yeah, case. yeah, absolutely. Cause there's so many like, like, it doesn't even have to be like a war, just like even testing nuclear weapons. Like, yeah. fuck up a lot of I mean, actually, actually I, I forget which one of these isn't on the news, but they basically, there's a couple of existential threats, uh, pandemics, nuclear weapons, uh, AI takeover, uh, threats to democracy, uh, period. Um, mm -hmm. Those are, and like income inequality are like these big global level problems. Mm -hmm, and like mm -hmm. some of them fuel other ones, right? Like for instance, income inequality makes it harder to have a fair democracy because if people are really rich, they can buy even more votes. Because, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if it, for instance, like this is just a random idea, but for instance, if it was one IP address, one vote, you could say, therefore, what you want is to redistribute IP addresses. You know, because that, that seems like you could do it, right? <laughs> oh, God, I mean, like... I mean, it'd be different than the Electoral College. You could compare the two. I mean, like, the way it's, like, I, like, <laughs> networking governance is, like, a fucking shit show. Like, if you've ever looked at, like, a network... Oh, it's probably system. better than the U.S. Like, they, like Ooh, the I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, at least um, we have an alternative to compare, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, because like if there's not once the, once there's not a monopoly then maybe free market logic can work right like you need enough government regulation to make sure there aren't monopolies which is why they're looking at breaking up facebook oh really i didn't know they were like oh yeah yeah they might split up facebook and instagram oh shit that's wild yeah how is that even gonna work because they're so integrated i'm like what <laughs> well, apis i hope like yeah but like what? oh my god that's going to be interesting if that happens. I mean, another thing they could do, because like, you know, there's been a couple of cases where they brought in the social media CEOs to Congress just recently. And like last year, they brought Stephen Wolfram in too. And um, one thing that Stephen Wolfram had to tell Congress is like, look, I named this thing called the principle of computational irreducibility. And it means that we can't just tell you what these systems are going to do. We don't actually know until they're running, like exactly what's going to happen. We So you can't just... <laughs> pass a law saying we have to prove to you that the software won't do xyz yeah. like we don't know like, I, there's, it's computationally way. irreducible in many cases and they were like fuck okay computer wolfman says it says so we better go with that <laughs> so they didn't <laughs> I feel like they would have pursued that route otherwise and it's sort of like you know sometimes you can have some guarantees like provably i mean you can actually you can prove the first past the post tends towards a two-party system it's called mm -hmm. a divergent law um you can you can imagine passing a law saying that you have to have an electoral system that Diverger's law does not apply to, so that you don't get a, a duopoly. Um, a <laughs> duopoly. You, know, you could have, you, that's what Brett Weinstein likes to call it, the duopoly in the States, um, the, to the two parties. It's like almost as bad as a monopoly, because the duopoly, if they collude with each other, then they're, they're a monopoly. Yeah, then it's like one. You know, it's like only one person to get along with, like whoever is <laughs> running the show next door. And you're like, okay, let's, let's play it this way this season. Oh, okay you know, collusion, market collusion or whatever. But yeah, so if you break, oh yeah, so like all these Congress appearances have happened and they've been looking at, you know, section 230? Uh, no. So back in the day, Prodigy had paid moderators. Facebook does not have this because if they did, they would be liable for mm -hmm. what people say on Facebook because maybe their moderators failed. But don't that, they though? They have they have fully like like so, whole ass basically like moderator factories, don't they? Well, it, see, it's it, it's they've started to do more and more, which is why Section two thirty is starting to come under review partly because for a long time they were saying, "Listen, we're like the telephone company. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't control the message. Like you can't mm -hmm. like you know if if someone gets on the phone and engages in hate speech, you can't sue Bell Canada." Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was the model. They were like, "Listen, we're like this phone company." We, which, which, but, but if Bell Canada was censoring certain calls, then Bell Canada would be more like a publisher that's taking responsibility for like what is and isn't said on their network. Mm -hmm. So that the more that tech companies intervene, the more they open themselves up to legal liability. For oh, I see, I see. Yeah. So if they intervened all the time, like if, if Facebook paid people to moderate every single Facebook group, they'd have lawsuits up the yin yang. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't be protected by Section 230. But they're talking about changing or repealing 230 in the US. That's one of the reasons they hauled all the CEOs in there. Mm, I, see, I see. Yeah. 
it's always funny watching Congress talk to tech CEOs because it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> they're, they're both not sure how stupid the Congress person is as far as tech knowledge. They're like, <laughs> Congress was like, I think I know a bit now, but am I still stupid? And they're like, mm, on some points, yes. <laughs> it's like this was hard ten years ago. You know, if you should look up if you haven't seen it. Um, stuff about how ages ago Congress tried to make a website. Like in the 90s, oh, no. it was complete cost or fuck because they had to like argue about vote of every aspect of the website and eventually they just got a private company to do it. That's so fucking good. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> also like not hard to believe. Like I've, I've worked in public sector. It's like, yeah. yeah. So it's they've been looking bad. both at section 230 and at breaking up Facebook. Like you can see they're, they're looking at various angles, especially because it looks like, it, it, it kind of looks like um, via... Twitter, et cetera, Donald Trump stole p power from the Republicans and the Democrats to a degree. Mm. Like, it, it reduces, like basically both sides of the aisle are pissed off at Facebook and Twitter because they're reducing how much power the political parties have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just like they, they shut down Facebook's currency and now they're like, okay, well, what about the rest of your influence here? You know, Because it's been unregulated for a while for things to innovate, but now that Facebook's a monopoly, Facebook's not innovating anymore. It hasn't in mm -hmm. a while. It's just like, we're Facebook, we just are Facebook and we're here forever, but bye, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's your whole, that should be their motto. We're here forever, bye. <laughs> like, fuck, they really don't need to. It's actually interesting too, to watch like all of these crazy features they're like adding and, or like sometimes taken away too. And I'm just yeah. like, cause I was on Facebook Democracy. like like 10 years ish ago. Yeah, that's when I started using Facebook. And I mean, that wasn't even its infancy. And like, it was just mm. so like, you know didn't have like any of those shit now i'm just like there's so many buttons i get lost in like the ui even though i like use facebook literally all the time so like <laughs> i don't know man <laughs> well if we decentralize podcasting this way nobody has to use facebook technically just use zoom and youtube that would be the dream but like obviously you know a lot of people yeah, are gradual that. Trend. yeah but i mean as far as like 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 for the part of the internet where people are supposed to have public conversations for the sake of democracy, like as opposed to arguing with Twitter bots or having like, you know, Facebook threads, Facebook doesn't even sort the messages in the right order and threads anymore. It's ridiculous. Like mm -hmm. it's not a conversation. Like, oh my God, like, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and we all know what YouTube comments are like. So like, yeah, <laughs> but actually talking to somebody is completely different actually than all these different platforms that are like, by contrast, very experimental in terms of like modes of human communication. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm um fuck i had a thought oh, this keeps happening i was so tired that's <laughs> sorry this is a stream of consciousness yeah yeah exactly uh i'm tired in a good way man the last couple of weeks have been fucking whack everything's been so fucking whack the last couple of months i don't even know it's been mm. bad. <laughs> i'm so glad the year like the work year is over though holy shit can let my consciousness stream just like indefinitely it's gonna be great yeah with the, the random constraints of topic <laughs> one person's on topic is someone else's off topic yeah i mean like do they is it ever like both of them are on topic has that ever happened like yeah 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 it's not like yeah i mean like the idea that like everything is about reaching consensus is kind of oppressive actually it's kind of something that developed over time in like studies of deliberate democracy or whatever like initial simplified questions are like what amount of what amount of deliberation do you need to reach complete consensus on something it's mm. like well that's one question you could ask but like if you also ask like if you reach complete consensus does that suggest freedom <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> oh yeah that's a whole other question you know <laughs> i mean like i don't know i'm definitely you know being in security is a weird spot because it's like on one hand i feel like you know i'm at this like cross section of like there is people who are, you know, so they get into security because they are so, like... Paranoid? Yeah, yeah, like, paranoid and also, like, you know, they want free information. That's, like, oh. it. Um, the fucking irony, though, is that, like, our jobs are quite literally securing information so that it can't be just, like, indefinitely spread. Um, and it gets, it gets really weird because it's, like, you know, I, I'm not even working in, like, let's say, like, some top secret like shit or whatever right um but there's definitely you know you hear stuff from like people who like are part of that or like you know you go to like these underground conferences and it's like there's like things that people like really just have no fucking idea about like what's actually happening um 
so it's just it's been a like it's been something I've been really thinking about recently um in terms of like just out of it's so strange like it's such a strange like like duality to like live exist in between <laughs> yeah it reminds me of a, a video that just came out yesterday from this uh I guess former therapist Daniel Mackler who has an interesting YouTube channel and um it was, a, it was about how confidentiality works in psychotherapy and like the conditions under which psychotherapists do in fact break confidentiality. Mm. And um, I, don't know, I mean, perhaps you can see the analogy I'm seeing here between that and the computer security case, because uh, in both cases, I'm, you know, well, you know, like even people who uh, are doing the actual quote unquote moderation at Facebook, uh, you know, they'll need therapy for all the traumatic things that they see, like filtering all the worst possible. Oh yeah, yeah, stuff absolutely. On Facebook or on Twitter or anywhere. And it's like, and so like, basically one of the things he was laying out is that because um, uh, what a lot of therapists hear is difficult to process, they do end up talking to other people about things for the sheer fact that like, that, you know, they need to process it somehow. I mean, I don't know yeah. how, I don't know which areas of therapy have like a formal rule about like a therapist should have their own therapist, but that maybe that's. <laughs> that was literally a thing I was looking up like a couple of weeks ago. Oh, I was yeah. like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, I guess there are a rule about this. Did your therapist, have, it's like, should your teacher have a teacher? Should your therapist have a therapist? Yeah, like who gets designated as like other therapist therapist versus like, you know, just like not therapist therapist. Well, actually, <laughs> you could even ask like a networking question of like, how would the network of meta therapists have to be arranged such that confidentiality was maximized? Yeah. Is it because well, because what Dan and Mac was describing is that medical hospitals, they'll have like team meetings of like 30 people all sharing stories about this or that patient or whatever. And it's like, well, that's not optimal at all. Like, like, okay, the therapist probably needs to talk to somebody for oversight but not a room of 30 people. That's in no way is that necessary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's interesting too, because in networking, we actually have that concept. We have like, you know, like core networks, which are like the backbones of like, you know, networks. And then there's like all these other like routers that are like around it. I forget what the exact terminology is. I was fucking, that's too long ago back in college. And then, you know, there's like the end nodes that are like the actually the ones like delivering it to like the masses kind of thing. So that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Well, should we um should we um pause our podcast here? And, sure. Uh, yeah, give me a break. Have a little okay, let me, let me the. Well, everybody, I hope uh, you enjoyed episode four of live stream of consciousness. Uh, we'll be back, and those all there will always be more to talk about. <laughs> See you all soon. <laughs>